with the quotient of the Carton subalgebra by the, by the Weil group. And then, as before, we have the new potent cone, which is the, the fiber over the origin. And uh, recall from the talk of Fu that uh, this is a disjoint union of uh, finitely many orbits of uh, certain new potent elements. Now, the picture, this is a kind of symbolic picture, uh, of the new potent cone might be like this. So you see the, the, the cone is itself uh, is singular and, and here you can see of these finitely many strata you can see three in my picture, namely the regular one, then, then this orbit and the, and the trivial orbit here. So in general we have this, this Hasse diagram and uh, there's always the dense orbit, the regular one, and we have the subregular. Afterwards, there's a mass, like in the case of E8. And then there's a minimal one, which is called so minimal because there's another one below, which is just the, 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 uh, the zero. Yeah? So this is the, the minimal non-trivial one, and then there's the origin. And, uh, and there's something, something in between. And, uh, so here in this picture we have the regular one and then we have the subregular and, and, and all the others. So in this picture uh, what I want to do is take a slice to the, to the, uh, which is transversal to the, to the orbit of a nilpotent, a nilpotent point, which, uh, which I always assume to be non-regular. And then this uh, slice will cut out from the new potent cone some singular variety. And uh, all this takes place over, over T mod W. And uh, this is the zero fiber here. And if I, if I uh, take another point here, I might get, if, I'm, if I pick this point generically, I will, will uh, find a uh, smooth, uh, smooth fiber here. So if I restrict the characteristic map chi uh, to S. So this means that restricting chi to S gives me a deformation of this uh, singular variety here. And uh, what I'm interested in and what I want to discuss in this talk is the, uh, is the question, it will turn out that this is um, is, uh, is a Poisson deformation and uh, I, I want to show that this in many cases is the, is the universal Poisson deformation. And to do that, I, the first step is, is uh, to choose S appropriately to, to simplify calculating, uh, calculating with S. And there's a very special choice for S. Choice for S. And this is the so-called Slotovy slice. I mean, these, these slices uh, have been in use even before Slotovy, but it's traditional nowadays to, to call them Slotovy slices. And, and the idea for the construction is the following. So we take x in uh, n to be uh, uh, a non-regular, well, yeah, non-regular, nilpotent new important element in, and in order to avoid trivial considerations let's assume this is non-zero and then by the uh, Jacobson models of theorem uh, we can complete this x to, com to an SL2 algebra so complete complete to uh, an SL2 triplet x h y so this is now uh, an SL2 sub Lie algebra in G, and consequently, consequently, G decomposes into uh, finite dimensional irreducible representations of this SL2, and let me indicate them pictorially like that. 
Yeah? So there might be a bunch of such, uh, such representations and x moves up and y moves down. Yeah? We have this typical uh, uh, decomposition. And if you think, think of, the, of the tension space to the orbit of x, then uh, well, this is given by the adjoint action of, uh, and linearized means this means that I just take the commutator of x with any element in G. So this is the image of the adjoint action. So in, in this picture here, you see that those elements that are in the image of x is just everything except the element in the bottom. Yeah, so everything above is in the image. So there's a natural candidate for a complement of that, which is the kernel of y, well, because y annihilates exactly these, these parts here. So, so we have uh, this decomposition of g into the image of at x plus the kernel of at y. And this will be our choice. So the Slotovy slice is Slotovy slice is uh, defined by x plus the kernel of at y. So that's an affine subspace in uh, in G. And uh, one of the advantages is that it comes with a natural C star action on it. And for the C star action, we use the element H in our, in our SL2 triplet. And uh, so I define a, a C star action, C star action as follows. I let a T, so for an element in the slice, we let Tx uh, by saying, this is t to 2 minus at h of z. Yeah? So meaning that if uh, z is an eigenvector of, uh, uh, of at h, then, then this acts with t minus the cor corresponding weight. So if you look at the, what is the effect of this, well, in this picture it's clear that the weights of all the elements that are annihilated by y is certainly negative, or at most zero. So if I take minus, this means the, the corresponding weight is uh, non-negative. If I add 2, it is strictly positive. So, so, the, so we get something strictly positive here. And on x itself, well, we have uh, this x with weight plus 2. So if I turn this around, it becomes minus 2. And if I add 2, this cancels out. So, so the so the result is that somehow this element is a fixed element and everything else is contracted into it. Yeah? We have a strictly positive action. So, so on this C star, on this S, we have a C star action with, with a unique fixed point being the point X that, uh, that I started with. Yeah? So these are, these are the main, main players of the game. We have this, uh, this uh, slottery slice and, uh, and, and the C star action. So before I continue, I, I would like to to illustrate this in a, in a very simple example uh, so that you get uh, a feeling for the fun of it. And uh, the case, uh, well, you don't mind if I do some calculations. You said it should be informal. Uh, do, do you? No, it's a. Uh, huh? Yeah, I mean. So put it this way, it's, it's concrete, yeah? So, so uh, it's, uh, I want to do the following concrete example. And uh, so let's take, for the Lie algebra, I take, uh, I take uh, SL, SL, uh, SL3, yeah? So in SL3, we have uh, exactly uh, three orbits that correspond to the three possible Jordan block decompositions of a 3 by 3 matrix. Yeah? And uh, so if, if this is SL3, then the regular orbit corresponds to this Jordan type. And then in this, in this particular case, the subregular and the minimal orbit coincide. And then, of course, we have the trivial orbit here. So let's, let's take this orbit. And, and so the X I want to take is, uh, is this matrix. And it's natural to choose Y to be this matrix. So here we're in the subregular case, which is, which is the case that uh, uh, is, is treated by the, by the uh, Grotendieck-Priskorn theorem. Uh, 
So what would the slice in this case be? So the slice here is, is, is the set of the following matrices. Well, I take x, and, and now I have to take all matrices that commute with y. Yeah, and, and so which are these? Well, first of all, y itself. So, so if, let me choose the coordinates in such a way that it looks nice afterwards. So I have u here, and then I must have zeros here, and then so the only ones that commute are a and c, and then of course there's one element in the in the Cartan subalgebra uh, which uh, also commutes with uh, with this y. So this is the slice. Yeah. Uh, so uh, you see we have four parameters here. So this is an affine space isomorphic to uh, C4. So the next step then in the in the calculation is is to to to, uh, to compute chi. Yeah, so chi, and that in this situation is consists is given by the components of the uh, characteristic polynomial of uh, of this uh, of this uh, matrix. So what we need to consider is the determinant of uh, say t times the identity minus this matrix. And uh, well, it's that's an easy calculation. Let me copy it in order not to make too many stupid uh, mistakes. And I think it's this. Yeah, so we, of course, the the trace vanishes, and uh, so there are only two coefficients left, and these are these two uh, quadratic polynomials. So they, they 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 give the map from from S to down to the to the quotient here, and the uh, so chi chi two is uh, b squared plus u, and chi three is uh, a c plus u b. So if we're interested in the fiber, the fiber is cut out for any choice of the, these, these base variables, chi 2 and chi 3, is given by these equations. Now, here, the funny point is that will be of interest later is that the variable u shows up in a, in a linear way. Yeah, that's not to be expected in general. It's a polynomial. But here, by coincidence, or perhaps not, there's a, there's a linear variable. So we can solve for, for u. Here, yeah. So we can we can write u is uh, is uh, yeah. What is it? Chi two minus uh, minus b squared, and can can substitute this into into this equation. So we finally we, we, we get the following equation. So substituting here produces a term b b cubed. Yeah. So we get a c minus b cubed, and then we suddenly get uh, minus chi three. And uh, now I have to get the order right. So it's it's b times plus with a plus sign, I guess. Yeah. So it's plus uh, chi two equals b. And uh, what you can see here is that the zero fiber, meaning that that chi two and chi three are zero, is uh, is indeed an uh, a two singularity. Yeah. So we have uh, this a two singularity here given by by this polynomial f, so and uh, more, this what we see here is the universal deformation of this a two singularity, because if we look at the at the uh, ring C A B C, the the uh, the Milner ring as it's sometimes called, which which is obtained by dividing out the uh, Jacobian ideal of f. Then this is uh, very small, and because we we divide the derivative by a gives c, the derivative by c gives a, and we divide by b squared. So what is left is a, is a two-dimensional vector space generated by the elements one and b, and uh, so here we have the uh, the possible deformations parameterized by chi two and chi three. So so the upshot is that in in uh, what, what we see in this case that this. Uh, is the, the universal deformation of the of the singular uh, hypersurface, two-dimensional rational uh, hypersurface here, provided by the restriction of the characteristic map coming from the Lie algebra, and uh, and of course it's it's uh, it's not a coincidence, but part of the theorem of Grodenberg and Priscon that the um, that the type of the singularity 
is indeed the same as the one with the Lie algebra that we started with in case the Lie algebra is of type, type uh, ADE. Yep. I think I omit drawing pictures of the singularities. You want to see them? No, perhaps not. You want to see them? So a picture, a, a real picture of the real, of a real version of the A, of the A2 singularity looks like that. Uh, and then uh, if you deform this a little bit in the, in the, in the correct dimension, uh, correct direction, uh, it, uh, it, uh, it becomes an A1 singularity, and uh, if you deform it a little bit more, it looks like this. And in this picture, actually, you can, can see the two cycles. Uh, here's, here's the first one. And here's the second one. Yeah, so this is the is the, is the real picture of uh, of the universal deformation, and so in this space here, we have uh, there's a discriminant locus, and uh, so for points on the discriminant locus, we have this this situation, and outside we have that. So this is this is the picture for um, for the typical picture for a subregular element. And in this subregular case, the, uh, the, uh, the singularity is always a surface singularity. And the theorem of Grotendieck and Prieskorn says that in the ADE case, um, this is the universal deformation. And in the, and the non-simply laced cases, there is, uh, you have to modify this a little bit in, in taking into account graph automorphisms of the corresponding Dünkin diagram. And, uh, and the question we posed ourselves is what happens if you, if you try to do the same thing for lower strata? And then the, the first question is why did not uh, someone else did this before? And, and say Slodovy or, or Priscon. And one of the obstacles is that if you, if you take elements in the, lower, in the lower orbits in this hazard diagram, the singularities will no longer be isolated. So if you apply ordinary, ordinary deformation theory, they will not have finite dimensional deformation spaces. So somehow there is no way of saying that this is universal. And the situa situation changes dramatically if you, if you keep in mind that these uh, varieties always have symplectic structures. So, and, and so they are Poisson varieties and you can apply Poisson deformations. And if you restrict yourself to Poisson deformations, suddenly everything becomes finer dimensional again. And so it makes, uh, you can try to imitate that. And, uh, and then indeed you get Dugatis theorem, and, uh, which is the following. So, so we assume that uh, G is, is uh, simple as before and, and let X be uh, uh, the uh, nilpotent nil I mean non-regular nilpotent. Nilpotent as before. We take S, the Slotovy slice. For some any any choice of your SL2 triplet, and then <coughs> chi from S to <coughs> is the universal is the universal uh, Poisson deformation 
is the universal Poisson deformation of uh, S0, except in the following cases. Of course, we know that there must be exceptions because uh, it's it's uh, it's not true in the in the iskon Grotendieck situation. And uh, in the following cases, so the first case is uh, is uh, uh, if we have the Lie algebra of type B, then we have to exclude the subregular orbit. In the case C, there are many more orbits that have to be excluded. And uh, the ones that we need to exclude are orbits of Jordan type, of Jordan type uh, 2n minus 2i, sorry, 2n minus 2i, 2i, or n, comma n. So this means type uh, Cn. And then what else do we have? Um, uh, G2, yeah, so G2. So in G2 we have to exclude orbits. I knew there's a mistake. F comes before G in the alphabet, so whatever. B, C, G2. So in the G2 case we have orbits of dimension uh, 10 and 8. Recall from Fu's talk that the orbits there in this case are 12, 10, 8, 6. Yeah, so these and uh, 12 was the, was the regular one, so it's 10 is the subregular one, and this one is the sub subregular one. So, so subregular and sub sub we have to be included. And then in the case F4, it's again the subregular one. Yeah. So in, in all other cases, this is the universal Poisson deformation. follows the, the pattern that Namikawa has explained in, in, uh, in his talk. And uh, so let me, I, mean, I will not go into details, but only indicate what, what steps before have to be taken before applying the machinery of Namikawa. So, so uh, the situation was like that. We have uh, we have this, this simultaneous uh, resolution. So here we have uh, G, B, N, which was the cotangent bundle of the flag variety. And then we have the Slotovy slice with its map to S. And the zero fiber is our S zero. And here we have our point X, and then, and then over S we have, uh, sorry, S B, and the, the pre-image of S zero is S B zero, and then we have, lying above X, we have uh, the Springer fiber. So if this is pi, let me denote by uh, F X. Springer fiber, which is the origin of this X. Okay. So, if we if we try to imitate the proof, then somehow we need to. Basically, what we need to verify is that uh, that. Uh, the period map, or the, in ordinary deformation theory, the, the Kodaira Spencer map, which is the map from the base T into the, into the deformation, first order deformation space uh, of the object we deform, which would in this case be the second cohomology of SB0, that this is an isomorphism. Now, that's exactly the same step as in, in Namikawa's proof. And in order to do that, 
So, so basically it comes down to checking second cohomology, I mean check, second, check, second Betty numbers of, of, uh, uh, of fibers in, 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 in this picture to, in order to reduce it finally to the theorem already proved by Namikawa. So, so the key point, and again, let me say, I will not go into details about this deformation theory. I just want to indicate what is, what is the, the, new, uh, the new technical step. The new technical step consists in, in, uh, in keeping control of the second Betty number of, uh, of this, uh, this Springer fiber. So, so the point is that, that imitate, imitate Namikawa's proof. In uh, example one, <coughs> and the key point is uh, control, control the second Betty number of uh, of uh, f x. Yeah. So recall that, so what do we know? If x is regular, then uh, fx is just a point. Yeah? So this is the case which is not of interest to us, yeah? because in that case, this is, this is, uh, this is the smooth point, so it's, it's, uh, it's an isomorphism near this. So there's nothing happens there. So the first case which is interesting is if x is subregular. In that case, fx is the resolution of the origin in the in the surface singularity so it's a bunch of uh, it's a bunch of uh, p1s which come in a in a in a in an ade configuration yeah so here so the second betty number in this case is uh, some number say l prime where l prime is the rank of the dunkin diagram dunkin diagram let me put it here Dunkin diagram of the resolution. Yeah. Then something else happens in between, and so in the worst case, so in the in the simplest case, so to speak, if x is zero, so this is the very bottom of the stratification, then the Springer fiber is uh, is the is the origin of of zero, which is just the null fiber. In, in these uh, vector bundles, so it's the flag variety. So in this case, fx is the flag variety here. So meaning that the second Betty number, the second Betty number of this thing, is the um, is, uh, is 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 L, which is the rank of the Lie algebra. Right. So if we're in the ADE case then these numbers are equal by the by the work of Grotendieck uh, by the work of uh, Grotendieck Springer uh, Grotendieck <laughs> Briscoe and Slodovy yeah so these uh, sorry sorry in the ADE case these uh, these are equal by the work of uh, Briscoe and Grotendieck and in the uh, in the uh, in the non simply laced cases we know that this is bigger because the Dunkin diagram of the Lie algebra is obtained by from the Dunkin diagram of the resolution by modding out the quotient action of the of the graph automorphisms. So this turns is, is bigger than, than this one. So in general we uh, we prove the uh, the following lemma. Lemma which says that if uh, if we have one point which is contained in the closure of the orbit of another nilpotent point, then in this case, the second Betty number of the fiber of x prime is less or equal than the Betty number of f. So of the theorem is a bit more precise. The corresponding map of, uh, of cohomology groups is injective. But uh, this, is, this is easier to remember. Yeah, so, so what we have is in this, if we pass from the subregular orbit to, to smaller orbits, the Betty numbers drop continuously yeah, until they, they finally reach this point. 
And, and the point is that the uh, universality of the Poisson deformation holds. So meaning that we can reduce everything to the case that is already proved by Namikawa if we are in a situation where this, uh, where this number reaches its minimum. Yeah. So as soon we uh, reach an orbit where, where, where the Betty number takes its minimal value, which is obviously this one, yeah, because this, this, this is the smallest orbit, we do have a universal Poisson deformation. And uh, well, that's, uh, now you sit down and, and work out what the uh, Betty numbers of the Springer fibers are in the situation for the exceptional, for the exceptional, uh, for the sim non simply laced, for the non simply laced uh, groups, and uh, for, um, and we did this uh, in some sense by a case by case study for all th all cases, and uh, for the cases B and C we can we can use uh, we can do it systematically. Uh, for the case G, we, we run it on a computer by writing down an explicit description of, of G2, which is simply enough for 14-dimensional Lie algebra. In the case F4, we use techniques developed by Balakata uh, for, uh, to calculate, uh, to calculate uh, to determine the cohomology of the, of the Springer fiber. And uh, so this reduces to the, uh, well, this finally proves the theorem. Yeah, so com combine Namikawa's theory with the calculation of, uh, of, the, uh, of the Betty numbers of the Springer fiber. And uh, so that's, that's, uh, that's uh, what I want to say about the uh, universality of the, of, the, um, of the Poisson deformation for the, for the lower strata. So the upshot is, in basically all cases, the, uh, the picture of, of uh, Briskorn, Slodovy, and Springer holds, holds through if you replace uh, ordinary deformation by Poisson deformation. Uh, so that's the good news. And so what happens in the exceptional cases, I, I will uh, perhaps only uh, come back to at the end of the talk. For the moment, I want to, want to switch a little bit the attention uh, to, to, uh, to another uh, issue, which is, um, so of course, comes up in the, while we were discussing this. And the question is, is the following. So let's go back to the, to the, to the original situation. Yeah? So we have, we have our slot of V slice S sitting over, over T modulo W and providing us with a deformation of the singular symplectic variety. And you remember that in the case I discussed, I mean, this means that chi was given by two equations. In general, S0 is a complete intersection given by the components of this chi. Yeah, so S0 is a complete intersection. But you can ask, is it possible to, to, uh, to push S0 into a smaller affine space. Yeah, I mean, this sits in, in S. And uh, can, you, can we, can we uh, somehow can we embed S0 with smaller, with smaller co-dimension? Yeah. So like in the, in, the, in the example I discussed, you remember there was this parameter u, and if I solved for it, yeah, I can get rid of one equation so that it becomes a hypersurface. In the extreme case, if we can push it as far as possible, we can ask, is S0 a hypersurface? Now, the, uh, this should be difficult in general. And, the point is that my feeling is that symplectic singularities need in as a philosophical uh, statement which I cannot make more precise um, is that they need more space than usual so they so it should be rather hard to, to embed symplectic singularities with, with small co-dimension and if you push it to an extreme saying you want a symplectic hypersurface then this should be a rare phenomenon and I was so naive to believe for some time that actually ADE singularities are the only examples. And then 
then uh, now I believe that the new exams we found are the only ones. So that you show that <laughs> you see that I have not learned from. So I s I'm still as naive as before. Uh, but uh, but so the new examples that uh, that arise are indeed the answer is to the second question to the third question is sometimes, and it happens exactly. I mean, for for in in that situation, we have exactly the following cases. So so. Uh, uh, our next theorem uh, is, is, is the following, that S0 is a hypersurface exactly in the following cases. Well, we have uh, first is, uh, of course, all subregular ones, as we already know. And these, uh, these subregular ones correspond to the classical ADE equations that you all know, so I will not write them down. And then the second case is that in, uh, in, uh, in, C, uh, in, in, in CN, there, there is the, the type orbit, sorry, slice to uh, x of type of Jordan type 2n minus 2 comma 1 1 and I will write down the equation in a, in a, in a minute and and the next case which is interesting is pardon? I'm forbidden to write there okay uh, um, I write here so so here in uh, in uh, so the, the last the third example is, is in, in G2, and, and here actually all orbits work. Uh, all, uh, so meaning uh, slices, slices to orbits of dimension uh, 10, which is the subregular one, 8, and 6. Yeah? So, so it means that here we have a series of examples of four-dimensional Hypersurfaces, and then there's one. So this is uh, this is uh, of course classical uh, uh, D4 surface. This will be something four-dimensional, which we already recover here, and then there will be a new example, which is of dimension six. Yeah. So, and uh, so the equations are quite nice, and uh, and uh, are as follows. So equations well I omit the uh, ADE which you know and then more interesting is the is the four-dimensional case and it's the following very nice equation a squared x plus uh, 2aby plus b squared z plus xz minus y squared to the power of n and uh, so the five variables here are a, b, x, y, z, and uh, this. Uh, and now you take n for any n bigger than two. And of course, these are all non-isolated singularities. Yeah. So you have. Uh, so the picture is we have C5, then we have this hypersurface, we have sigma, and then we have uh, zero. So we have this stratification, and the singular locus is given by the equation a equals b equals zero and xz minus y squared equals zero. So the singular locus here is an A1, is an A1 uh, cone. Uh, so, that, uh, so this describes this, this series of, uh, of the C5. And uh, for the G2, we get, a, we get a, in some sense, at least from the optics, uh, a similar, uh, similar equation, uh, except that we need a little bit more work to write it down. And, uh, but I will do it because it also sheds some, from a different point of view, light on the, on the example that uh, Fu discussed. Uh, namely, consider the S3 action on, uh, on C3 just by permutation. And then I take the hypersurface that consists, uh, the, uh, the hyperplane of those things where the coordinates add up to zero. Yeah, so that's the standard two-dimensional representation of that. And then I can, uh, 
uh, make the symplectic by, by adding its double, and so I get a copy of uh, C4. And uh, if I mod out this uh, S3 action, I do get an embedding into, into C7 um, by the following seven invariants. If I have an individual action of S3 on, on C3, then of course we have the three elementary symmetric polynomials, sigma 1, sigma 2, sigma 3, and by definition sigma 1 vanishes. So I have two, two invariants, sigma 2 and sigma 3. If I have two copies of these spaces, I need to polarize these invariants. So polarizing the quadratic invariant gives me three quadratic invariants. And if I polarize sigma 3, I get four cubic invariants. So let me give them names. So these are A, B, C, and these are P, Q, R, S. And uh, so this now here is, uh, is, uh, is uh, co-dimension 3 Gorenstein uh, in uh, uh, singularity in C7, and you can, can write it down it as, uh, as the Pfaffians of a 5 by 5 by five matrix. So in fact, it's given by five equations. And uh, well, while I'm at it, I can might, might as well just f write them out completely. And then there are three. Uh, well, perhaps I do not. Well, let me give you one of them, and then you can guess what the others are. So the structure is like that. I mean, here you have, oh, well. And here, of course, you get the, the terms that correspond to the equations for the twisted cubic RQ minus PS plus 2 times R squared minus QS. So these are the these are the uh, five uh, relations for the for the for the seven invariants of the of the classical action of S3 here, and in these terms I can now write down the the equation, which then looks like u1 squared a minus 2 u1 u2 b minus plus u2 squared c plus 2 times t1 squared minus t1 t3. So superficially. You see, it looks very similar, but of course, in truth, it's uh, it's more complicated. And uh, huh? It's not surely not, surely not. Yeah, yeah, no, no. I said, as I mean, it's given by Pfaffians uh, of this. And uh, so here, the picture is: we have C7, we have the hypersurface, we have a singular locus, and we have the singular locus of the singular locus, and uh, we have zero. So this set here is exactly the minimal what, what, what terminology minimal singularity to the to the six dimensional orbit in the eight dimensional orbit yeah that's exactly this and and uh, it's a pinch c2 and why why does it show up well this sigma here is is uh, the singular locus is exactly this quotient so so here we have uh, c4 and you mod out the s3 action onto that so so uh, the, singular, the singular locus of, the, of this quotient arises from looking at the stable of, you know, of the points with a non-trivial stabilizer, which in the C4 is the union of, uh, of, three, uh, of three planes. So if you take, to pick one of these planes and map it to the singular locus, then this will be the normalization map. So this is the pinch, pinching singularity that, that uh, shows up uh, in, the, in the G2 case. Yeah? And uh, so these these are the examples we have, and and uh, and uh, we, we we were quite happy to, to find these uh, new uh, hypersurfaces, and uh, now my new naive hope is that these are all, uh, and uh, hmm? yeah, one 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 has to preserve some naivety in, in life, <laughs> and so so we try to uh, to. Uh, to prove that, of course, and now become now we we enter the stage where we don't know much. Yeah, so that's a. Well, well, of course. I mean, if you if you have if you if you have this f, yeah, and and uh, and you want to have this f to be 
singular along something that you know, then, then this F somehow, of course, has to lie in the quadratic ideal of the ideal that defines sigma. So in this case, sigma is, is, is given by the equations A equals B equals XZ minus Y squared. And in, in this case, sigma is given by, is sigma is given by, by these equations here, right? So, so, so now you can see, so, if, but now if you try to write F as an, as a general, general element, which is in the, in the square of this ideal, well, you write something like a square times some factor plus a b times something and so on. And, and now you can, of course, be fancy, write some, some fantastic polynomial x to the power of 1000 and you will not get any result. So in some cases, this is, this is rather minimal. So it's on the borderline between where it works and where it is too trivial to work. Yeah? And, and similar here, I mean, you see that this lies in the square of the, uh, in, in rather narrowly lies at the square of the ideal. I mean, here is no modification at all. I mean, just with constant coefficients. And here we modify with, a, with the smallest possible thing, which were equations of, the, uh, uh, of degree uh, uh, 3. Yeah, so this is rather, rather at the bottom of the, uh, of the quadratic, uh, uh, of the square of the ideal. So that's the, what they have in common. Yeah, and of course, this gives, uh, as, I mean, this is such a, yeah. So why should there be any hope that a, that a classification ought to be um, uh, not out of um, the question? So. Let me make a very, very short excursion uh, to, re to recall some of the linear algebra of Pfaffians very, very, very briefly. So, is, uh, so suppose we have uh, theta to be a skew-symmetric skew uh, matrix of uh, dimension 2n. How do you say in English? Dimension or order? Or the, uh, how do you call the, the width of a matrix? Size. size yeah. Of size... Uh, uh, Size? Miles? How do you say? Okay, no. Huh? So, of, 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 size, of size 2n. Yeah? So, of course, I can, I can, I can think of this as, as being, a, I can associate to this a, a, a two vector field a, a di smash dj. <coughs> Yeah, and then then what is the Pfaffian? I mean, I, I can uh, one way of writing the Pfaffian is the following: I take uh, theta and I take uh, the smash product of n n copies of this, and then of course this will be something like d1 up to do, uh, d two n with some factor in it. Yeah, and and this is the is the Pfaffian uh, of uh, of this matrix. But now let's pass uh, to the case where this is Q. Skew symmetric, but of odd size. Uh, so if this is of odd size, then I can still write this theta, and I can still, of course, also take theta with uh, with uh, with n uh, n copies of that. And then the result is an element in is an element in lambda two n of the tension space, which I want to identify with the cotensions. So for me, this is a, is a one form. So, or if you expand it in, uh, in as, a, as a vector, yeah, we, we can write this as the sum. And then there is, uh, I want to, want to think of this as, as, uh, as the components of a vector uh, dxi. Yeah? So, so this, these components, uh, the, so the the Pfaffian of a, of, an, of, a, of a matrix, matrix, matrix of, of odd size is for me a vector whose ith component is up to a sign just the ordinary Pfaffian of the matrix which is obtained by cancelling the ith column and the ith row. Yeah? So in, if I form that, then, uh, then it's one of, the, one of these properties is that uh, this one is always in the kernel. Of, of this odd matrix, yeah. Of course, the, this, it, because it's in, it, it, it has skew-symmetric matrices have, have even rank, so so there must be a kernel 
here, and, and this is this. Moreover, if the rank of this matrix is exactly 2n, so the maximal possible, then this is the kernel. So there's a so we have a we have a we have a, a canonical way of writing down the kernel of, of a of a stereometric matrix of odd size and maximal rank. So now let's let's apply this to the geometric situation and assume assume that, that we have a X hypersurface in uh, C N. Uh, N is uh, is uh, is 2n plus 1 and then we have uh, sequences of this type we have omega cn restricted to x is omega x and then we can uh, dualize the sequence and uh, get uh, tx tcn restricted to x and ox and then the co-kernel here uh, measures the, uh, the, uh, the, uh, the deformations, I mean the, um, um, uh, of, uh, of the singularities of, of X. And here we have, here we have, uh, we assume that this is a symplectic hypersurface, of course, yeah, not, not any. It's a symplectic hypersurface. So we have, we have, uh, the Poisson structure gives us a map from omega X uh, to TX. And I can combine this in and splice the two sequences into into this sequence. And then here, I have a matrix of odd size, and uh, and uh, by the very exactness of this sequence, uh, this this kernel. Um, uh, so this is DF, of course. Yeah. So what we see here is that DF is in the kernel. On the other hand. By the very assumption that this is symplectic, this means that the Poisson structures normally generate in smooth points. So smooth points are exactly the same points where DF is non-zero, and the matrix has maximal rank. So the Pfaffian is non-zero. So we have the, this is in the kernel, the Pfaffian is in the kernel, so they equal up to a unit, which has to be a constant because I assume everything is is, is homogeneous. Yeah? So. The upshot is that in order to get such a situation, we have the following rather strong condition. Yeah, because and and this this condition means that, and uh, this condition means that, um, well, it's not only sufficient to have to find some skewsymmetric matrix and calculate its Pfaffian, but the Pfaffian has to satisfy an integrability condition, yeah? so it has to satisfy Schwartz condition in order to come from a hypersurface. Yeah? Conversely, if I start with the hypersurface, I, the Jacobian, uh, I mean the derivatives of F, need to be the Pfaffians of a skewsymmetric matrix. So this means this is a strong overdetermination, in some sense, for for both structures, yeah? and that should make it rare to exist. Yeah? Of course, on the other hand, we have examples, so there might other creepy things coming in and uh, so we, we, we need to uh, work to, to, uh, to make sure that uh, this uh, is, is, does not show up. So before I, I will borrow five minutes from, uh, from uh, what Namikawa left from his talk, yeah? so, so, so uh, if I'm allowed. Yeah. So, um, so for the moment what we can for example show, but this is about the borderline of what we are able to really prove is that if we have an hypersurface here and again uh, take sigma the singular locus and now look at what uh, Fu called the minimal singularity meaning that if, if this is the hypersurface and it's singular locus look at what happens transversely uh, here yeah so this is a surface this is always of co-dimension 2 so if this is uh, if this is 2n this is always of co-dimension 2n minus 2 by a result of uh, Bouville so, so, uh, so this is always a surface singularity, and you can ask yourself, what is the generic type that is, shows up here? In in the examples we have, this type is always d n. Well, for some n, let me call it d m. Yeah. So it's always of type d m, which is a bit surprising, because uh, if you well not, Miles knows more. Huh? Now, of course, it's A D E, but what? Why not A? Yeah, why is it D? Yeah, yeah, that's surprising because if you if you hit on a symplectic singularity, 
I mean, the probability is very high that you, that you hit A1. Yeah? But that's exactly what is not happening. And actually, we can show that A1 cannot show up. So in such a situation, this thing is never, never, ever A1. Except, of course, we are in the situation that in the, in the ADE itself. Yeah? But as soon as this is four-dimensional higher, it cannot be, it cannot be A1. Yeah, so it's something. You can take A1 times C2 and. No. No, I mean, A1 can never show up. I mean, look, I mean, I'm always in the, in the, in the, in the, in the, under the assumption that we have a C star action and that this is a non trivial hypersurface in the sense that the origin is, an, is, an, is a singularity. Of course, you can always take a product. If you take just something with A1 and take a product with something smooth, you can. But this is not an example in, in my sense here. Yeah, I want to see contracting C star action, and 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 so in non. I mean, should not decompose into products. Yeah, and in, in that in that sense. And uh, so this is this is the, one of the things that we that we can show, and and I want to conclude with a with a different construction. Which, which does lead to the same hypersurfaces, but does not mention Lie algebras and, and, and Slodovy slices. And uh, for me, this is a further indication, well, if you, if you find an, a new construction which leads to the same examples, this might, well, well again, I might be just naive. <laughs> so here's, here's a second construction to produce hypersurfaces, symplectic hypersurfaces. And, and what we can try is the following. So we take SL2 and let me add an odd dimensional, an odd dimensional representation of SL2. So the total is then an odd dimensional vector space. And I want to define a Poisson structure on its coordinate ring. So, what? What did I say? I said odd, I mean I meant even. Yeah? So this is supposed to be even, <laughs> and then this is three dimensional, and three plus even is odd. Yeah? It ought to be odd. Yeah? So I take this odd dimensional representation, and uh, well, actually, I take this dual. But, uh, and then I want to put a, a Poisson structure on, on, the, on the coordinate ring of that. So, so I need to write down a theta matrix. So what do I do for the theta matrix? Yeah? So this put, gets into these blocks. And here, this is the block that comes from the, from the Lie algebra. So here, just I take the Lie Poisson structure, which is just given by the ordinary bracket. So here, I let me write Lie Poisson for, for this slot here. So in this slot, I take the linear action of SL2 on W, resulting in W. Let me abbreviate this by writing rho. And of course, then here, I have minus rho transpose. So the only thing that is optional in this Ansatz is, is, the, is the phi that we have here. So what should phi be? Phi should be a map from lambda to w. Well, in this ansatz, up in, in, in theory, this could be, could be bigger. I want that. And of course, this map has to satisfy Jacobi identity. And part of the Jacobi identity is that this is SL2 equivariant. And then there's a condition, which is the, the, the remaining part of the, of the um, uh, of the Jacobi uh, condition is that something happens for lambda, lambda 3 of W. So, so uh, let's check what, in the simplest possible cases, what, what can we get? In the simplest possible cases, so the first case is, is W is, uh, is the standard representation of SL2. So in that case, now, lambda 2 of w is the trivial representation. So an equivariant map from the trivial representation into this just means an invariant. So meaning phi should be an element in the, uh, in the invariant part of that. And of course, we know that this is just a polynomial ring generated by the Casimir element h squared plus phi for xy. Yeah. So, so meaning we pick a power of delta so this means that we get a 3 by 3 matrix where everything is determined. And here, well, the only option if I want to make it homogeneous is writing delta to the n for something. And then here delta to the minus, sorry, at n for something. Well, now calculate the Pfaffian and integrate, and you get the first series. OK. 
okay? First series. And indeed, there's no Jacobian condition because if you take lambda 3 of w, it's 0. So there's no condition at all. Yeah, so all, any choice here works. And then the second case is you take w to be c4. Yeah, so there's a, uh, with, 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 with the action of, uh, of, uh, of uh, SL2. Well, in that case, it's, uh, you see, we take, uh, we take lambda 2 of w, and then this decomposes uh, with this klebsch godan stuff into V0 plus uh, V4, where 0 and 4 are the highest weights. And then we need an equivariant map into, into this invariant ring. Well, I didn't, I mean, here, if you want the full story, you get C delta tensor, and uh, here we have V0, V4, V8, and so on. So, so you see that the trivial one goes into a, un a un unique something times a polynomial in delta, and this part also goes into a unique V4 times some polynomial in the deltas. So this means once we fix a degree, we have two parameters that somehow just do scale between V0 and V4. Now we have a non-trivial Jacobian condition. And if you, if you impose the Jacobian condition, then you find out that, well, it never works except for a single degree. And in this single degree, you have a fixed value between the, the two parameters. And if you write down the 7x7 seven seven matrix, take the Pfaffians and you integrate, you find the six-dimensional example that comes from the G2. Yeah? So, uh, and, um, and uh, well, honestly, I mean, this part, of course, is, is, is clear. Uh, sample calculations I did uh, with C6 and, and uh, showed that there's never any solution. So, uh, well... Of course, I believe, but I, I didn't prove it formally, that uh, if you take uh, any other thing, uh, it won't work. And, and also, I experiments with other Lie algebras. Of the, so, so this kind of ansatz produces exactly the hypersurfaces we have, but not more. And, uh, well, that's an uh, uh, indication that, well, of course, there might be completely different beasts that uh, are still lurking around. Yeah, but, um, well, I think that's, uh, yeah, I want to stop here. <laughs>